What up, y'all? Welcome back. Yo, this your boy Drell. And this your girl Cash. Back with another video. Yes, we are. Y'all see, we got some Mr. Ballin inside a Nigerian death factory. Mature audiences only. Y'all already know what to do, man. Subscribe to the channel. Hit that bell. Also, make sure y'all subscribe to our new channel, to our other channel right here. More Drell and Cash. Make sure y'all subscribe to that. Get us to 1,000K. Yes. We much appreciate that. But I'm ready to get into the suit. I'm ready to get into the suit. Let's go. I know y'all ready, too. In 2014, a group of young men discovered an abandoned looking warehouse surrounded by barbed wire in the middle of a Nigerian forest. Today's story is about the absolute horror they found inside of that building. Today's episode is going to be extremely upsetting, extremely graphic. As such, viewer discretion is advised. But before we get into today's story, if you're a fan of the strange, dark, and mysterious delivered in story format, then you come to the right place because that's all we do, and we upload once or twice every week. So if that's of interest to you, please offer the like button a free session of acupuncture, but as soon as they're lying down, go ahead and administer a full body allergy test. Also, please subscribe to our channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly uploads. All right, let's get into today's story. In Nigeria, motorcycle taxi drivers are called Okadas, and in Ibadan, which is one of Nigeria's biggest cities, home to three and a half million people, there are a lot of Okadas. However, despite their massive numbers, these Ibadan Okadas are actually a fairly tight-knit community made up primarily of young men. And so in early 2014, when two of these Okadas went missing, the community immediately found out about it and was really concerned. And when the police did not appear to be doing much to actually go out and find these two guys, the community of Okadas decided to launch a search of their own. Basically, as they went about their day driving around the city, dropping fares off, all of these Okadas would be going down side streets and looking in back alleys and checking all over the city for their missing members. But despite their best efforts, they never could find them. Then, on March 22nd of that year, a third Ibadan Okada vanished. He was a young man named Lanre Sidiku, and unlike the other two riders who went missing while they were at home, Lanre went missing while he was working. Lanre was part of a group of Okadas within the city who all kind of met up on the same city street, and that's where they stayed throughout the course of their day, trying to wave down fares as they came up. And so everyone in that meetup point all knew each other, and so they all knew Lanre. And on the day he went missing, they recalled seeing him driving away from this meetup point with two passengers on the back of his bike. Now, typically, the rides these Okadas would offer to their passengers were very short. They're only driving them just around the city. And so it was very quickly noticed that Lanre had left and after several hours had still not come back yet. When it was noticed by the other Okadas, they began talking about it and someone said, you know, give him a call, make sure he's okay. And so they called his cell phone and Lanre did not pick up, which was highly unusual, not just for Lanre, but amongst the other Okadas. They always have their phones on because they're looking for new customers and customers could be calling them. And so their cell phone is a vital part of their work. And so his phone is off. They don't really know what to make of that. And then out of nowhere, Lanre actually calls this group of riders. However, he was calling them on his second cell phone. Lanre would keep a work phone and a personal phone. So he was calling them on his personal phone. And so when this other Okada answered the phone and heard Lanre's voice, he put the phone on speaker so the others who were concerned could hear what was going on. And what they heard was Lanre totally hysterical, screaming into the phone that he needed help. He said that he and eight other people he was with, who he didn't even know, had been kidnapped and their kidnappers had brought them to this underground prison cell. They couldn't see anything, wow. but they could hear people walking above them. Lanre also explained that when they had been kidnapped, the captors had taken all of their belongings, but they hadn't recognized that Lanre had this secondary cell phone, which is why he was calling from it. And so in between Lanre's frantic descriptions of what was going on and what had happened to him, these Okadas that received this call, they can hear in the background these other eight people that are with Lanre in this underground cell screaming out as loud as they can 
probably to get the attention of someone, anyone who was above ground, who might be able to come down and save them. And so these Okada riders who are getting this call from Lanre, they're horrified. And they're trying to calm Lanre yeah. down so we can explain where he is so they can go find him. And finally, Lanre, he does compose himself and he gives them really specific directions to this footpath that led into the Soka Forest where he said he had been taken. The Soka Forest was a very dense stretch of wilderness right on the outskirts of Ibadan. Lanre would tell them that he had no idea where specifically in the Soka Forest he was. However, he said, if you just keep walking on that path, eventually you'll hear us calling out from underground and you can come and save us. And so as the riders turned on their bikes and they got ready to head out and go rescue their friend, they told Lanre to stay on the line. Let us keep talking to you until we find you. But as they're telling him that, his phone abruptly cuts out. And then when they tried calling him back, his phone was off. Mm. About four 40 Okadas. Maybe his phone was dead. I think it died? I think, yeah. I don't know. But somebody got it. Or oh, probably somebody got it. I don't know. Dang. And you know it's so sad because I wonder why they didn't just call the cops. Mm. They take it in their own hands, remember they said? Right. Well, we, we don't know yet. Yeah, we don't know. Yeah. Out. And then when they tried calling him back, his phone was off. About 40 Okadas from Laundry's meetup spot took off together and sped down city streets until they hit this major highway that would take them out of the city. And then once they were out of the city, they went down this other road that brought them right towards the Soka Forest. And then as this road put them right up against the tree line on their left side of the Soka Forest, they all began looking for the two burned out cars that Lanre had said marked the beginning of this footpath they were looking for. And so sure enough, they find these burned out cars, they park all their bikes off on the shoulder of the road, and they quickly realize that this really is a footpath only. There's no way they can get their motorcycles yeah, onto the path. Not only because the burned out cars are blocking their way, but because the path itself is so overgrown with vegetation. I mean, they can barely see the path, let alone drive something through it. And so the men leave their bikes by the side of the road, and then unarmed, they walk past the burned out cars onto this path. And then because it was so narrow, they had to walk more or less in a single file line into the Soka Forest. Forest. And so as these men are basically marching into the woods, they're not making any sound because again, they're trying to listen for the sound of their friend and the other people that have been taken captive somewhere underground. And so they're That's silently crazy. marching right. through this forest when all of a sudden the guy at the front of the line thinks he hears something way up ahead. And so he holds his hand up to stop the line and they all stop and they're trying to listen. And then all of a sudden, about 50 feet ahead of them through the trees, this man they didn't recognize suddenly jumped out from behind a tree. He yelled something at them and then he raised his gun and began firing in that direction. The 40 Okadas immediately turn around and just sprint back down the path, right back out to the road. They hop on their bikes and they peel back out towards the city. When they finally get back to the... I wonder why they didn't have weapons when they went down there. Right. Like, all them gather up and get some weapons and Something just in case. Right. You don't know what you're walking into, yeah. especially if people got kidnapped. You don't know what you're walking into. That is true. And they told them that yeah. they're down on the ground, so you need, like, something right. Right. Ooh. They hop on their bikes and they peel back out towards the city. When they finally get back to the meetup spot they had all originated from, they realize they can't just leave Lan Ray and the other people he was with out to dry. They have to go back and rescue them. They yeah. considered calling the police, but given the yeah. lackluster response to the other two missing Okadas, See, well, they realized they probably would have a higher chance of old. saving their friend and the others if they just went themselves. So, and so the 40 what? Okadas. I mean, like. That's basically what it's in the world. Yeah. Oh, the right. They showed this. They said that. Police, so that's why they were doing an investigation trying what to find them. What if they got something? To do with it. The police? Yeah, because you know, <laughs> there's some crooked you never there's know. some crooked cops in this world, you know. You That's never everywhere. Know. You never know. Wow. That's in good so far. Yeah. Being their friend and the others if they just went themselves. And so the 40 Okadas rounded up another 60 from other neighboring meetup spots, okay. and this huge posse of over a hundred men all hopped on their bikes and headed back towards that footpath that led into the forest. No weapons? When they got there, they put their bikes on the side of the road, and this time, when they started walking down that path, they had guns, okay. knives, bats, all, all right. sorts of weapons, yeah. 
and they were not trying to be quiet. They were actually yelling like these loud war cries know. to let the gunmen and any other gunmen in the woods know that there was a horde of angry people that were coming right. into the woods for a fight. And so as they're marching down this trail, kind of expecting to get shot at at any point, it doesn't happen. Instead, after quite a while, they walk out of the thick forest into this huge opening. And right in the middle of this huge clearing That's is this fairly really small river, but it's big enough that it would be very difficult to cross. However, they can see there's a bridge, this kind of crumbling old stone bridge that goes over this river. And then on the other side of the bridge, on the other side of the river, they can see there are two dilapidated buildings. The one that is closer to the bridge is this small black shack that has a window looking out towards them and from their perspective they're maybe a hundred feet away from the shack they can't tell if anybody's inside of this building and then the other building was much bigger than the shack it was this huge kind of broken down warehouse that had big tall cement walls and then all around it was this huge mm -hmm. chain link fence with barbed wire wrapped around the tops and so this huge posse of Okanas they come storming out of the forest and they run over to that bridge which is the one way across and as they get on the bridge they're kind of scanning the two buildings they're not seeing anybody Buddy. And then one of the men, they look down underneath the bridge and they actually see Lonre's motorcycle. It's lying on the banks of this river, kind of tucked up underneath the bridge mm. as if someone had stolen it. And so everyone already knows Lonre is somewhere over here. We're going to go find him. Yeah, so the men, they get over the bridge, they go to that first building, that black shack, and they open up the door. It's a plywood door and there's no one inside. But the shack is literally stuffed full of hundreds and hundreds of articles of clothing and shoes. And so after kind of looking this over and not really sure what to make of it, the posse moved on from the black shack and made their way up to the fence right in front of this huge warehouse. And when they reach the fence, they're kind of expecting to be met with some sort of resistance. Yeah. I mean, the last time they were out here, they got shot at. And so they begin yelling into the warehouse for anyone in there to show yourselves, come out here. But it was silent. And so one of the Okadas that was part of the posse had brought along bolt cutters as a weapon to use as a club if he needed to. But as it happened, he began to use the bolt cutters for their actual purpose. And he bent down and actually cut a huge hole in this fence so they could go in and explore this warehouse. And so after a large percentage of this posse had gotten inside the fence line, they began walking around this huge warehouse to try to find an entrance inside. And so as they're walking, the windows that lead into this warehouse, they're too high up, so you can't actually see what's going on inside. It's silent, there's a pretty bad smell, but they don't really know what to make of this. Mm. They walk around the structure, and when they get to the very back, they find an entrance. All it is is this big rusted piece of tin metal, like sheet metal, that's propped up against a gap in the walls of the warehouse. And so one of the Okadas grabs this piece of metal and he pushes it out of the way. And then as soon as he did that, a few other Okadas quickly stepped through the threshold into the warehouse preparing themselves to have to fight potentially if there are gunmen or anybody else inside that might want to do them harm. But as soon as they see what is inside of this warehouse, they immediately lower their weapons and just stare in abject horror. According to the locals who lived actually in the forest relatively near where this warehouse was, they said there was actually another way to get to this particular area, to get to the warehouse. There was another path that was very rough, but it was big enough for one vehicle that came in from the other direction. Now, the locals said they didn't use this path at all. They didn't even know where it originated from. But they said for the last 10 years or more, they have seen one vehicle use this road all the time to get to the warehouse. And it was this black Jeep with black tinted out windows. And they said it would typically show up most nights of the week around 8 p.m. And they said it would just go down the road, it would make its way over to the warehouse area. And then around 9.30 p.m., they would hear or see the black Jeep leaving. Now, none of the locals knew who was driving this Jeep, although they knew it was a man. That was really all they knew. And they had no idea what this man did when he got over near the warehouse. However, for the last 10 years, every time this guy was over near the warehouse from 8 to 9.30 at night, they would typically hear screams coming from that part of the woods, coming from the warehouse. So all that time, they've been, he been going on there for 10 years, right? 10 years. And they've been hearing that sounds and stuff like that. Nobody ever tried to do anything about Nobody, that. Nobody, even the cops. I'm pretty sure they called the cops or anything. So, so that's why I'd say... Maybe, Maybe the cops the had something to do with it. it. Yeah, in on it too. Because there's no way you let something like that go on for 10 years. Screaming and stuff like One that. One vehicle. 
Yeah, one. Yeah, let's see. House. They would typically hear screams coming from that part of the woods, coming from the warehouse. And when the locals brought their concerns to police, the police just kind of blew it off and didn't do anything about it and actually told the people, right. yeah, don't worry about it. Right. And so over the years, the locals had kind of just accepted that about this man in his black Jeep and the screams coming from this warehouse were just a part of life. And so no one even reported it anymore. Had the police followed wow. up on the locals' concerns about this Jeep and the screams, they would have discovered that that warehouse was actually a storage facility for a very in-demand and very illegal product. And that man who drove that black Jeep, mm -hmm. he would take this illegal product and he would bring it back with him in batches and he would sell it on the black market. When this posse of 100 plus Okadas pulled that metal door aside and they stepped into the warehouse, they were not met with any resistance. Anyone that had been there, any other gunmen or guards or anything like that, they had fled when they heard the sound of this massive posse whooping and yelling on their way in. And so as these Okadas are standing inside of the structure surveying what's in front of them, the first thing they noticed is right in the middle of the structure on the ground is this cement slab. It's about four feet by four feet, and one corner of this slab was elevated slightly by some rocks that had been placed under it, hmm. kind of propping it up, pitching it on an angle. And then just off of the side of the lowest point of the slab was this wooden bowl that had dark stains inside of it that was positioned in such a way that if you put water on the slab, the water would drain off of that corner directly into this bowl. Basically, it was there to catch any runoff from whatever was happening on this slab. Around this cement slab, all over the dirt floor, were bones, some with meat on them. And then what? beyond the bones and beyond the slab, all around the perimeter of the inside of this building were extremely malnourished catatonic people chained up wow. to the walls. These people were the highly in demand, highly illegal product. More specific. It's so, it's so sad that the people of that area, they had to go find them. You know what mm -hmm. I'm saying? Like, and like for the cops to not to do nothing about it. Not to kill. That's suspicious. At all. And it was going on for 10 years? Yeah, that's. And they've been the illegal product. Right. Were the highly in demand, highly illegal product. More specifically, their body parts were the product. In Nigeria, a stunning number of people believe that certain magic potions and mm. charms will grant you wealth and success and in some cases infinite life. But the catch is, the herbalists who will perform the magical rituals and give these potions and charms to people that pay for them, they often require human body parts for them to work. And so what? human body part factories like this warehouse in Soka Forest Crazy. were established in order to meet the high demand of people that needed these parts. And so the way it's believed it worked at the Soka Forest warehouse was the man in the black Jeep. He would get orders from people that wanted specific body parts for their magical potions and charms and whatever else they needed. And he would make a list of those parts. And then at 8 p.m., he would show up at the warehouse and he would communicate with the people that worked at that warehouse. And they would determine out of all the captives they had, who had the parts they needed. And then oh. after figuring out which captives were going to be used that night, they would go into the main section of the warehouse and one by one, unchain these people they would drag them to the center of the room and in full view of all the other captives they would put them on the slab known as the slaughtering slab and they would hack off the required body parts and they'd bag them up put them in coolers and then the man with the black jeep he would take those parts and he would leave and then the person who's just been butchered, if they were still alive and might have a chance of surviving, they'd just be brought back to the wall and chained up again. If they did not have a good chance of survival, then they'd be brought to the very back of the warehouse in the back rooms where they would be discarded. Now, the means of execution varied, but in the yeah. back rooms of this warehouse, they found a makeshift guillotine, which cuts off people's heads. And they also found a large crocodile that was chained up. And so it's likely that those were at least two of the methods used to discard of. of the people they could no longer harvest organs from. After the Okadas kind of broke out of their initial shock of what they were seeing inside of this warehouse, they went around and began freeing people that were still chained up to the walls. 
And in total, there were 23 people that were still barely alive, still wow. inside of this warehouse, but none of them were Lanre Sidiku. And then after checking all of the dead bodies and body parts that were inside of the warehouse and then also right outside, where there were a number of shallow mass graves, they couldn't find Lanre amongst them either. And so this huge posse began looking all over the property for an entrance to this underground prison that Lanre had described being in. But they couldn't find it, and so eventually this posse made their way back over to the survivors who were being tended to by locals that had come over. And they asked the survivors, you know, are you aware of any underground prison cells somewhere around here where other people were being held? But the survivors either didn't know or just were unable to speak anymore. And so later that day, when the police did come out, because word got out about this huge find out in this forest, the posse went to the police and begged them to please begin digging up this entire property. We need to find the entrance to this underground prison cell. Lan Ray and eight others, and who knows how many others beyond them, are trapped underground in these cells, and we've got to get to them. But the police just kind of refused. They in on it, just like you say. What? They, they in on it. They in on it. How do you mean you refused? They in on it. And then you had to let the people get... So y'all heard about it. Now y'all got to come and do something about it? Mm, nah. Come on. Come yeah, on. Yeah, you hate that on here right they now. They're telling you what they um, found out from their friend that is an underground prison somewhere. Why Why are you refusing that? Yeah. Oh, come on, you man. Right. You was right. Cells, mm -hmm. we got to get to them. But the police just kind of refused and immediately just demolished the warehouse. And then after kind of cordoning off that area for a couple of days, the police basically just left and stopped caring about it altogether. They and never so did. the Okadas they never once did. again came together as a community and would spend the next several weeks going back out to this forest and just manually begin digging up all over this entire property in hopes of finding their friend and the rest of these people that were trapped underground. Yeah. But they never did. And so we don't know what happened to Lan Ray and the other people who were trapped in that underground cell. We don't know what happened to the other two Okada riders who went missing Damn. right before Lan Ray did. Wow. Although it's generally assumed they most likely were kidnapped as well and probably met a similar fate. We also have no idea how many people were butchered inside of the Soka Forest Warehouse. However, given the massive amount of clothing and shoes inside of that black shack, it's believed the total number of victims is easily in the hundreds. Damn. No one has ever been officially held accountable for the atrocities that took place in the Soka Forest. However, a couple of days after the warehouse was discovered by the Okada oh, Posse, the Posse was back digging, looking for Lan Ray, when they discovered there was this man who was there who was kind of walking around, mm. acting suspicious, and so the Posse confronted him, and it would turn out this guy had several human tongues in his pockets, along with dozens oh. and dozens of cell phone SIM cards. Well, assuming he was part of whatever happened there, the Okada Posse proceeded to kill the man on sight. Later on, a yeah. woman who was a survivor from the warehouse would tell reporters how she got kidnapped. She said she lived in Ibadan, she was well-educated, she had a good family, she was just sitting outside of her house, mm. when all of a sudden this van pulled up in front of her, and these very official-looking men were inside of this van, and they got out and they told her, you know, you're under arrest, you gotta come with us to the police station. And the woman was so confused, but the men were very professional and seemed very convincing, and so she got inside the van, they shut the door, and they drove off. And very quickly, once she was inside of the van and couldn't go anywhere, she realized they were not police, she had yeah. been kidnapped, and within the hour, she, along with several other people who had probably been kidnapped in the same way, were stripping their clothes off right outside of that black shack on the other side of the river, and they were told to put their clothes and belongings inside of the shack while they were being held at gunpoint, and then once they were naked, they were promptly marched into that warehouse where virtually everyone around her would be butchered and killed. Damn. So that's gonna do it, guys. That's crazy, because something that go that went on for so long and the cops didn't do nothing about it, the locals had to do something about it. Mm -hmm. They had they rally up a hundred plus people to go find that warehouse and to find their friend, but they still didn't have to find their friend and the other people that no, was in the underground. Either. What if they took those because you know they went there first and and when they went there first they shot at them mm -hmm. so what if that person who shot at them went back and tell the other who, and the, moved them and moved the, the ones who was in the um, underground mm -hmm. and take them somewhere else you never know but the screens thing about it, like with the cops why did you refuse to 
Cause the cops dig probably help dig up and look and see if it was actually an underground prison, but it had to be somewhere because their friend wouldn't tell them that. Yeah, cops been in on it. Yeah, yeah that's my to. guess. They had to. That's they, they been in on it somehow. Somehow, screaming cops been on it. going on. Nobody wanted to, and then they said nobody was held accountable. So Still. you didn't have you didn't do an investigation or nothing to see what's actually going. You just tear the warehouse down and and then just forgot about it. And that's it. Because I mean the cops really never did care. They never did, so who they gonna hold accountable? And you know what's so sad? Because stuff like that is going on now. We Still nobody going don't on know to this about day. Yeah, nobody to don't know about day. it. All that trafficking and all that other stuff, yeah. Sad. That's that's sad that they had to find it. it you know, but that, I'm glad that they helped the, the rest of the people that they was able to help oh, yeah. them. But the other ones the and their friends they went through, man, that's that was, that Oh was, my that's god. Sad. That's crazy, yeah. All right, y'all, let us know y'all opinions and how y'all feel about this down below in the comment section. Don't forget to subscribe. Click that bell on the subscribe down to the channel as well. Mm -hmm. More Dreadhawk and Cash. we catch y'all next one, y'all. Catch y'all next one.